Welcome to the Maintainable Software Podcast, where we explore the art of improving existing software with seasoned practitioners who have helped organizations overcome the problems often associated with technical debt and legacy code. I'm your host, Robbie Russell. On this episode, Naomi Cedar, who is an independent consultant, trainer, and author of multiple books, including, most notably, the Quick Python book, Third Edition. Naomi joins us from Chicago, Illinois, in the United States. Naomi Cedar, we're so glad to have you join us on Maintainable. Welcome. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thanks for, for inviting me to talk to you. Excellent. I'm looking forward to diving into some fun topics with you. So as you reflect on your experience in the industry, what do you believe are a few common characteristics of, dare I say, well-maintained software? You know, I'm not sure I could say I was in the software industry. I did software for other industries, which may affect the way that I, I think about things. And um, that said, I, I done it for, um, I suppose, embarrassingly close to 30 years. And um, so uh, I think the things that I value in, in software that is, is expected to go on for a while uh, are um, a sort of clear organization, separation of concerns, encapsulation, however you want to talk about that. It gets talked about in different ways. Uh, and then um, I think also, um, what should I say? Uh, visibility, instrumentation, I sometimes call it. That is to say, uh, ways to find out what is going on as the program runs. And, you know, uh, tests, tests are nice, clearly. Um, but uh, for a lot of the things in my life where things have gone horribly wrong, it was because there was something happened that it would have been very difficult to test for. You know, if you're going to test for everything that happens in, in the real world, in effect, your your model becomes bigger than, than your reality in a way. And, and so uh, I guess my thinking is more, I want to know what's going on with the program as it's running with real data so that we can can actually find out what the problem is and fix it. I mean, you know, sometimes that's um, error messages that scream horribly when they die. Sometimes it's log files that are just the right size, not too big, not too small. I, it depends. But those are the things that I think I value most when I am am trying to, to make uh, a... Uh, basically what we would call legacy piece of code, um, continue to be useful. It's interesting, you know, thinking about visibility, you know, having been in the, in the industry for, as you said, around three decades or so, do you find that in the current landscape of, let's say, observability type tooling and things like that, do you feel like tooling itself has is making it much easier for people to have visibility into their applications or versus what you felt like it was maybe two to three decades ago? Do you feel like we're better off having all these options available or does it actually seem more complicated? I, I think we are. I think we are. I think the flip side, though, is that some of those tooling options are, they will let you look in and see practically everything. Quite often they are somewhat expensive either in terms of fees or in terms of basically the effort to stick them into where they need to be so that for a lot of my life, I've been in sort of either smaller companies or startup companies where quite often it was hard to get buy-in for spending that kind of money slash time on that tooling. Do you feel like in those places that you've worked with, worked in over the years, that time spent on trying to figure things out versus outsourcing that time in a different way, using a different budget, because it's like, well, we already know what the overhead costs of our developers are to bring on these additional expenses, like some observability tool and then plug it in. I guess there's also the, you know, the integration time that also happens, but do you feel like that was a mistake by those organizations or do you feel like it was just too quick of a, no, let's not actually go down that path because it was just seen as like the monthly recurring costs might go up. It's, it's kind of hard to say. I don't think I would go so far as to call it a mistake. It's always arguable, you know, what you get out of it versus programmer time and things like that. I think in a lot of cases, 
those kinds of places sometimes maybe don't value programmer time as highly as they should. So I don't know. What are you going to do? I mean, you can't argue about that sort of valuation very effectively in a lot of cases. That's sort of an emotional decision, I think, that's kind of already made. I've never had a whole lot of luck in in fighting those. Maybe I'm just not persuasive enough. I don't know. <laughs> I, I can appreciate that. It, I, I run a software consultancy and I've had, I found myself overhearing conversations like in Slack or something with their developers and they're talking about, oh, well, there's this one tool we could potentially use, but our client would have to spend like $500 a month for us to use it for the next few months. So we're going to figure out our own thing. And then it was like this interesting process. I'm like, well, how much time do you think your own thing is going to cost? And so we're asking the, we're not asking the client to make a you know, forever incur this $500 a month cost, like we need it for two months. What's that in relation to how much time that we're even spending debating whether we should use something like that? Can we just plug and play with that? Or is it going to take, you know, hundreds of hours to do our own thing? And then like the client might have asked, like, isn't there a cheaper way to do this? So that's a good point. It's a good point. I mean, um, and I think I'm thinking more and I might be Yeah, it depends more on maybe solutions that were maybe an order of magnitude more expensive than that. So yeah, at least. Sure. Do you find that you've used the metaphor technical debt very often? Yes. Um, I mean, it's it's kind of a a funny phrase in a way because it's something that uh, pretty much every developer I've I've known uh, will use quite a bit and 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 they're afraid of it we need to get rid of it everybody is embarrassed about the amount of it that their organization has everybody has it so that's that's kind of one perspective then getting to get non-technical management to take it seriously is quite another quite another case. I think partly because business types are used to all kinds of debt. So it's not as scary as it is to software types. I I think, you know, a lot of particularly younger developers sort of are almost afraid that they're going to do something that will incur technical debt. Entrepreneurs, business types use debt all the time, right? It's just a thing. We do that. So I don't know. Do you feel like you're, you know, everybody, you said almost everybody uses technical debt and whether or not they're able to be persuasive enough to advocate for addressing some of that at some point. And as you also said, every project probably has plenty of technical debt. So we all have it. We're all embarrassed by it, but it's the reality. And so do you feel like your understanding of what technical debt has evolved over your career? Like where do you feel like there's ever a point where you look back and like, I might have been using that in a weird way, but wouldn't necessarily consider that technical debt from what I would see that what I might consider technical debt to be today. I don't know if I would say that. I think maybe as you might have guessed from from what I just said, um, I think my my understanding of the way that it fits into what the organization is doing, the seriousness of it, the immediacy of it. I think maybe I've gained an understanding that there are a lot of, 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 shades, gradations of, of how you might evaluate that. I think that's probably what's changed most with experience. Have you found there to be some productive ways for, you know, it sounds like maybe you've been part of, typically been part of smaller teams, some effective ways for your smaller teams to, to keep an eye on those types of things. How do you manage technical debt or what have you seen work well or approaches that maybe you, you've tried and it didn't really work out, but kind of look back on it like maybe we would have, could have tried something different there. It's it's a good question. I mean, I think for a lot of those things, it really depends upon the situation that you're talking about. Uh, if it's possible, if it's practical, and that means that you maybe have um, testing and and some some various other strategies in place that actually are working well, then kind of cleaning it up as you have to go in and address it can work well. And I've seen that work particularly well in maybe um, a project that the team has developed over the course of a couple years, and then they go back into it. So you have people who kind of already know what's there. Hopefully you already put the tests in as you went and things like that. So you can go and make changes and be have some hope that you're not breaking something mysterious somewhere else in the program. I 
have not seen that work terribly well when you've got some sort of hoary legacy code that is poorly understood and 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 it's kind of difficult to work around and things like that you know when you get to that point where you're really everybody thinks it should be rewritten but we don't have the time you're stuck as far as i can see is it a safe assumption that a lot of the projects you've worked on were had already existed prior to you joining those projects i would say it's about 50-50 do you prefer one over the other out of curiosity, being like a, a maker versus a, a mender of software? So I guess I'm not sure if I would think of it exactly that way. I guess I tend to think of it as you have to do something and you're given a box of parts and maybe you can, you know, make some of your own parts. Maybe you can go and select your own parts completely. That's wonderful. But many times you're given a box of parts and you need to then construct the machine that does what you need to do out of those pieces. So maybe it's legacy systems and things like that. I think personally, I enjoy that puzzle of taking all of these different pieces and putting them together in maybe a novel way that does the thing. But it, it is in times more frustrating as well. I mean, it, it's kind of a trade-off. I've also enjoyed kind of architecting something from scratch and then sort of adapting it as it goes along too. But. I personally identify more as like a mender than a maker, partly because I think when I worked on new projects for a long time, for clients, most of those clients didn't figure out how to make that project sell or, you know, like provide revenue or pay for itself for long term. So it, sometimes they just end, right? Those projects would, it would be a MVP of something and they go out to the market, they don't find their, you know, product market fit and it goes away. And so you kind of have, I felt like I had a, a graveyard of, of a portfolio, of, you know, in some ways and be like, well, a bunch of attempts at things. And if, if I found myself finding it way more rewarding late down the road to be like, Oh, I can come in and help an organization that already found value in the software. They already understand that there is, they, they know what they need if they have a budget to continue working on it, not just to build the new thing, right? And so it was always, I feel like it changed the way I thought about software as soon as I started taking those types of projects over spinning up a new project and then crossing your fingers and hope, wishing them the best as they chart off into this uncharted waters of figuring out how to like run their business with this piece of software. Versus, so I found like, oh, I get to learn from other, the other programmers that already made decisions on this project. And how do I improve things? How do I wrap my head around, as you were saying, like the puzzle pieces, like decisions were already made. I can't change it all right now. So how do I work within these constraints? And I found that that to be very rewarding for me as like kind of like more of a, I like to get in and out of projects pretty quickly. And that's one way that I've been able to do it where I don't have to like map out the whole architecture for something. So does any of that resonate with you or do you find... I, yeah, I, I think that's true. I think I've been pretty fortunate. I, I, I think I've only had one big thing I worked on that ended up kind of, well, I would say collapsing under its own weight before we really got it to, to production. I think the other thing that I would, I would play off of that too is that I have never thought of myself as being a, quote, business type, except by observation over the years. I'm usually much more interested in how the business, whatever it might be, organization, etc., works at that level than a lot of software types. So when you think about it that way, in terms of what does, what does this business, whatever, get from whatever it is we do, uh, then there is a certain amount to be said from something that is working and doing its little thing to just let it keep on doing its little thing and let's put our money elsewhere. And uh, so I think that also goes into uh, the, the utility of that. Again, I think a lot of people who are more purely interested in let's build software don't always want to stop and think about what it is going to be used for and what the benefit is of building a new one when the old one still works. That's fair. So do you find yourself more often, is it a safe assumption you're more often team like refactor versus team rewrite? Usually, yes, usually. 
I think really there's only been one big thing where I was I was leading that that we ended up deciding to do uh, a rewrite, and it was it was sort of a peculiar case in that. It was it was a company that had started up, and it was an e-commerce company. Our web platform had been written by our Japanese partners, and that in itself was interesting because I had to use Google Translate to understand the comments and things like that. But it was an implementation in Python of Cake PHP because the team understood Cake PHP, but they had been told they needed to use Python, so they rewrote it. It worked fine, but it was really between the Japanese comments and being this thing where most Python programmers had no idea what the original thing was. It was it was sort of a, a, a bear to maintain. And that was the one time where we just sort of backed off and said, OK, we're going to duplicate the functionality using Django as it was standard web platform in Python rather than trying to handle that hybrid. Otherwise, in general refactoring, yeah. We'll be back with our interview with Naomi in just a moment. Hi, it's me, Robbie. I just wanted to take a quick moment to say thank you for making time to listen to Maintainable Software Podcast. If you're finding these conversations valuable, please consider sharing a link amongst your peers and or writing a review on Apple Podcasts to help spread the word. Also, do you know someone that I should be interviewing on Maintainable? Shoot me an email to Robbie with a Y at maintainable.fm and state your case. And now, let's get back to our interview with Naomi Cedar. You know, you mentioned like how valuable tests can be before you start making changes and making sure you're not going to break something somewhere else. Are there any other considerations that people should be thinking about as if they're weighing that up? Like, should we be considering a rewrite or should we keep investing in this thing? And how do you help? What kind of advice could you offer people listening in that scenario? I think that you want to weigh what other benefits you get. Rewriting something so that you are in a new platform by itself doesn't make any sense usually, right? Uh, so what are the what are the positive things you stand to gain? Is it going to be performance? Okay, that's one thing. Is it going to be ease, easier to find developers? Okay, that's another thing. Easier to maintain. Are you going to be able to add functionality that you wouldn't have otherwise? So that kind of drives, I guess, how serious it is. I mean, I think there's also a question of urgency and things like that too. And then I think before you go much further than that, you need to be sure you understand at least roughly what that migration path would be. You know, honestly, that's that's a lot easier, I think, these days and with cloud and containers. And there are lots of different ways where you can kind of spring up a parallel system while you're you know, sort of cutting over and things like that. The bad old days. Well, I don't even want to go there. It was not fun. But still, you need to understand what that what that cutover, what that process is going to be. So all of those things kind of go into, uh, I guess, getting an idea of the risks versus rewards of doing that. And I think that's important. And obviously, if you have tests or not, if you have a specified system or not, I mean, you know, um, I, I have worked on one where it was almost impossible to understand everything that the system did. Replacing it was a darn good idea, but that meant really respecifying a new system and just sort of going on from there. No, that makes that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, thanks for for diving into that for for all of us. One of the other topics I was really keen to speak with you was related to community building. I know that you've been part of the Python community for multiple decades now. You at one time were even the chair for the Python Foundation for a number of years and also our co-founder of Transcode. So before we get into talking about Python and such, but like, what do you believe are some healthy characteristics for, say, a, a foundation for maybe an open source programming language or framework? What, what, what makes a good foundation? I mean, I think it's it's always going to come down to how people are treated. I think that 
having a very clear understanding that the people there have to come first is is really important. And I think it's probably the thing where you mentioned like programming languages and things like that. The tradition almost is that technical things come first. So, you know, oh, this is shiny language X. It's got these cool things. Therefore, we should have a wonderful community around it. And that, that's not how it works. So I, I think that the, the notion of being people-centric is, is really the key there. Just to kind of touch on Python, I think that's what's been done right there in that from the beginning with Guido and everybody that was creating the language, there was a, an understanding of the importance of people. I mean, you know, obviously over the course of 20, 30 years, what was understood as the, quote, best way to play, treat people has evolved. Thank heavens. But still, I think the, the interest is there. So I think that's, that's important. I mean, people have a lot of confusion or questions about community. And it seems many of them still just sort of hope that if they don't do anything too awful and they put something out there, there's going to be this community form. And I think that honestly is the result of some of the libertarian thinking about open source that, that, you know, back around the 2000s when open source was becoming a thing. No, I won't mention names, but you know who they are. Really took on this very sort of hard utilitarian, libertarian, uh, Ayn Rand, nightmarish sort of approach to how open source communities work. I think we're still working our way off of that. I think that that definitely resonates with me and my experience. And, you know, as someone that's been in and out of various open source communities myself and having a, like a pretty well-known open source project and there being community built around it. It's always this interesting thing where when I see like some of the larger projects, foundations that spin up and I'm always, there's a little bit of, it's not actually clear to me sometimes what I think a foundation sees as a responsibility or the things that they're trying to focus on. So for me personally, and maybe some other people on the, that have been afraid to ask what what sorts you mentioned being people centric? Can you can you share some examples of types of things that while you're you know are part of the foundation for the Python Foundation, for example, or things that you were like you and the team with the other board members were kind of actively addressing types of topics that would come up and how what, what goes on? What's the foundation ultimately doing? The example of of the of the Python Foundation isn't isn't bad because from the beginning they have had a mission and. It really has been used to guide them, and the mission is twofold. Protect the intellectual property, which, okay, it takes lawyers, but it's pretty straightforward to understand. And then the other part is to um, basically to create and, and grow a diverse international community. If you've got those two guideposts, then you really are a large part of the way there. How is it you grow community? Well... You need to keep the people that you've got and then attract more. How is it you do that? Well, by not treating them badly and making sure that new people who come in aren't treated badly and want to leave. You know, that's kind of how that, that follows from there. And again, I think maybe there are other uh, foundations, other efforts that haven't thought that clearly about what they want to do. And so maybe that is is part of the problem. Does something like the Python Foundation, when it gets down to a local level, let's say there's like a local Python user group in someone's nearby large city. I live in Portland, Oregon. I know there's like a Python group, for example. How affiliated are they? Tend to those types of communities end up being with the overarching, you know, primary foundation, or are they all kind of like these little separate entities that'll kind of just complement each other in some ways? Well, I mean, so. You know, nothing is stopping anyone in the world from making their own user group. So there, there is that. But uh, in general, um, for, for the Python uh, space, they are quite often supported by the foundation in the sense that, you know, money for meetup fees, things like that can be subsidized by the foundation. And 
mailing lists can be hosted by the PSF, some, some infrastructure like that, even in an increasing number of cases, uh, fiscal sponsorship so that you know, they need trouble. They need help managing nonprofit finances without going through all of the pain of being a nonprofit. The PSF can help them with that. So, so those sorts of things mean that in general, most of the uh, most of the U.S. meetups have at least that kind of connection. In the vast majority of cases, many of the ones that are in other countries do as well. Nice. Thanks for that. The I'm curious also, and maybe this will resonate with you, but I, I find that in a lot of, which has been great about, you know, software development, I feel it's become far more accessible in the last decade or so for people that are making career shifts where they didn't necessarily grow up becoming like, I'm super, I don't know if you're the kind of person that grew up with computers and were always kind of interested in it. And if I grew up before computers, I'm afraid. I'm sorry. <laughs> sure. <laughs> But like, you know, if you've been doing this for 30 years, I'm assuming computers popped into your your spectrum at some point. They they popped up and you you grabbed towards that. And, you know, me being someone that got interested in open source in the late 90s and the early 2000s, you know, whatever they call it, the the aughts, it very much was like, oh, this is like this whole rebellious community of open source community. Like I, that resonated with me. And I was like, I can go get paid to work with open source stuff. Maybe if I can convince this company to let me use this PHP thing or Perl or Python, they'll pay me to do this thing and we don't have to pay for a Microsoft license, you know, blah, 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 for all the things that we used to talk about back then. And so it was kind of, it was like this slightly uncharted territory in some ways. And that was, it was interesting because I'm like, well, there's no rules on how to make this all work just, but I'm, I felt like I'm fighting some other big entities. And now a lot of people, you know, come into the industry having had different careers potentially before, and they see this is a good place to make, you know, a better career for themselves and more money and, and more benefits for them, which is great, but they're not necessarily the same types of people as the early adopter people. And so you get this interesting intersection of like, I find that a lot of people in the community that have been around for the community a long time are always like, you should definitely participate in open source community, participate in open source projects, contribute, contribute, because that's what I always did. And that worked, seemed to work for me. But then I feel like there's this interesting pressure put on people that are coming into the industry. Like, well, if I'm not doing that, am I, am I not actually fulfilling like the responsibilities of my new career? Or can I just do some coding for six hours a day and then turn off my computer and, and go deal with my family or whatever else? And I'm actually not interested in the community part of that. I'm like, this is a job. I'm like, why, why do I need to do extra networking with mm-hmm. peers? Mm-hmm. And this? like, what's your perspective on that? I think, you know, I, I also started with, with open source stuff from the late, mid to late 90s on. I think it resonates in a sense in that I certainly share the feeling that it's like, well, of course you're going to participate. Why wouldn't you? And, and I agree that that's not always what happens. I've certainly had a lot of people on my teams who kind of, well, that's that's interesting, uh, it's like, oh, yeah, you should come to the meetup tonight. Yeah, yeah, well, may- maybe I will. And, you know, they never do. So uh, I do understand that. I think, though, that in a lot of my experience, the people coming in have really wanted to be part of the community. And it may be because of the people that, that I, I am in contact with, but a lot of Women who are joining the communities, and certainly in, I don't know, say in Latin America, I do a lot of speaking and have a lot of friends in Latin America and, and Africa and places like that, they're, they're eager to join in in the community because in many cases they feel that they've gotten some help that's gotten them in. So, you know, they've gone to a Django Girls workshop and learned to code for the first time things like that. So quite often I see some very emotional stories of of people almost in tears because I never thought I could stand up in front of a tech meetup and give a five minute talk and I did it and and things like that. So I I, I guess I also would say that I know that there are are many, many people out there that don't do that, don't want to do that. They want to have a job and, you know, that's fine. I, I think... Just to kind of put a little Philip on that too, though, if I'm looking to hire somebody, I know the kind of person I'd rather work with. That's that's fair. It was interesting. Uh, 
that was making me think like, do you feel that's feel free to answer this if you want, or we can, we can move on. But do you actually think that's equitable? Kind of depends upon um, the problem with, with equity and a lot of those things is that it's, it's very hard to, or, you know, it's very, there are a lot of different ways I should say that you can kind of assess that. So, it's hard to say. I mean, if somebody doesn't have the opportunity to do those things, that's one thing. And I, I think I would not be inclined to hold that against someone. If somebody has the opportunity and chooses not to, that that's a little bit of a different thing. So uh, a single mom with three kids, probably not going to get any hassle from me for not doing tons of meetups. I mean, that, that's, that's completely understandable. Or a single dad with three kids, to be fair. Yeah, otherwise, I don't know. I think I, think I would, would go ahead and favor somebody who wants to be part of the community without losing too much sleep over it. No, I, I can appreciate that. As, as someone that's been in a hiring role for such a long time, being the, you know, primary, the principal of our company, I've kind of struggled with this over the years of being like, oh my gosh, like this candidate, maybe they're... They're they're way more they're they're actively blogging and talking about these things. They've given talks at places, and so there's kind of like I find myself being like, oh, I have a weird biasness against that because that's kind of what I want to be doing more often, or it's what I used to do, and like so that resonates with me. And there's another part of me is like, but am I being fair to these other candidates that haven't had the opportunity, aren't even, but maybe they're not interested, and like they can like I can do my job really well for you and your clients, and unless you're looking for someone that's going to be publicly speaking as part of their job, uh, which can I can see a bit as a value add for the business. So it's an interesting weighing up all these kind of different things because, you know, it's like every, I'm always like, how many people on our team are more, are actually likely to submit a talk for the local meetup or, you know, a conference coming up. And it's usually a pretty small number. People say that they're interested, but I think they're really intimidated about even knowing where to start and maybe feeling a little pressure because of People like me might be like, oh, it would be so amazing if you did that. And so like, are, is that an expectation that I'm setting that they have to do that? And so I kind of, I have this internal monologue all the time. So I kind of. It's, it's, it's not easy to decide. And I certainly have done, I think, whatever I can to encourage and support people once they are on my team to, to do those things if they want. I, I would feel pretty funny making that a performance target or anything. I'm not saying that, but certainly if, if they're interested in trying that. So for those listening that are potentially interested in joining a local meetup, giving a talk or something in that, that realm, they're not really sure where to start. They've never been to a meetup. They've not, maybe even haven't done any research on where local meetups are or some online community. What are some steps you think people could take that are listening? They're like, I'd like to try to engage with the community, but maybe I feel like I'm outside too much. Like, what should they do? They, you know, you, it's, it's always possible to search for the actual meetups. So, I mean, you know, on, on the various uh, sites that, that offer those, there is a community section on python.org that they can visit to go and, and, and look for possible communities there. I wouldn't be discouraged if something isn't there because some, not all of them get reported. There are a number of online groups, so I know there is a, a Discord for, for Python. There's a Slack for Python. There's uh, various things like that so that people might, might actually look forward to try. All of those things, I think, might might be ways to to make the initial contact. Uh, as far as you know, should I go or shouldn't I? Uh, I have never encountered, and I have been to conferences and more informal meetup type gatherings in a number of countries. I have never found them to be unwelcoming of of new people. So, and that's of any of any level of experience. I've just never really uh, heard of that. I have occasionally known people who have still felt so out of place they couldn't do it, and that's, that's unfortunate, but I've never actually seen the communities really do anything to, to contribute to that. So that is, I think, one of the reasons why, as a language, Python is in the top three. For a critical point in its development as people were in, in adopting and, and looking for languages, I think 
we were. I think we still are, but I think at that point it was decisive that we were that, that welcoming. Hi there. We hope you're enjoying this week's episode of Maintainable. While you've been listening, has anyone crossed your mind who might be looking for help with their Ruby on Rails application? Planet Argon, the producer of Maintainable Podcast, would love to meet them. In fact, we've got a pretty sweet referral bonus program set up. If you send someone our way and they sign up for Planet Argon services, we'll give them a $1,000 discount. And your reward? We'll send you $1,000 just for connecting us to the right person. Sounds like a win-win for everyone. Head on over to planetargon.com forward slash referrals for more info. That's planetargon.com forward slash referrals. All right, let's get back to this week's episode. So I want to take a moment to plug your, you know, one of your books in particular, which is published with Banning. So the quick Python book, third edition, how would you classify the ideal audience or readers for that particular type of book? To my mind, I guess the ideal reader would be uh, someone who is new to Python, but not new to coding. It's, it's beyond that. It's somebody more likely than not, probably somebody who is looking to get kind of a mid-level understanding of the language as quickly as they can. So there are things that, that you could talk about that are, are much more advanced topics that, you know, are the stuff of wizards and so on that are deliberately left out of that book. But um, if you want to spend your time with 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 one book, you know, coding sorry, in some other language and come out of it being reasonably able to hold your own professionally, then that's that's the target audience. Interesting. So, so good for people that are curious about Python, or maybe they're looking to maybe maybe they're getting a job where the team uses Python and they've not worked on that before, and the company sees value in there. So there's those types of scenarios. It's so I was looking through some of the reviews. I haven't had a chance to read it myself yet, but I was looking through some reviews of it and stuff like that, and saw that it's, you're not getting into the maybe not so much in the weeds of like explaining what variables are. You know, it's not like an intro to programming book. It's a uh, very much a you have some probably some found fundamentals already. Let's let's kind of get you in and get you know maybe that's why the you know it has the word quick in the name of it. Yes, yes, yes. I mean, as you say, I don't explain what a variable is. On the other hand, what I do explain is how Python variables are different than say Java variables or something like that. So yeah, great. Another thing we kind of related to kind of your perspective. So out of curiosity, when you work on a larger project like writing a new edition of a book, what are some approaches that you've taken to work that into your schedule and routine? What I found basically works the best for me. This is what I always tell people is that the most important thing is to do something Every day, if you can't, okay, sure, you miss a day here and there, whatever, but almost every day do something, even if it's just going back and maybe revising a couple of paragraphs. Uh, I'm not saying that gets you the book done super fast. If you're working a full-time job and writing a book, it takes, it's a matter of months, even if you're fast to, to do that. But if you keep on doing something every day, there will be those moments where things come together and you can get a bigger chunk done, but you keep that momentum going. It's, it's far and away the most important thing, I think. Um, you know, of course, you want to plan out what you're doing and have a table of contents to work from, all of that good stuff, but that doesn't help. I, um, I don't know. That, I can't imagine doing a project that big as something where you try to sit down and knock it off in a couple of days or something like that. It's just not going to happen. You know, again, for the listeners, you know, let's say like they're, they might be thinking about like, oh, maybe I get involved in the community or maybe I could write a book one day. But then there, there's a little, you know, bird over the shoulder being like, who are you to talk about this stuff? You know, why you, you know, like, why, why me? Why, why am I capable? And am I the one to write this particular book or participate mm -hmm. in? Like, how did you get to the point where you're like, yeah, I should be the one to do that? 
<laughs> I don't know if I ever have gotten to that point. Um, I mean, uh, I am by training a classicist, Greek and Latin literature with a dash of Sanskrit and Egyptian thrown in. So um, other than the fact that those are funny languages, I'm not sure that I, I have any, any great thing that way. But I have been doing this stuff for a long time. Uh, my approach has always been that I will do, you know, the best that I can and then people will judge whether or not they want to take it. Yeah, I'm old. It's taken me a while to get there, but I really have found that that is the best way to deal with imposter syndrome is that just by kind of addressing it, being up front with yourself and anybody else who who is interested that that's, you know, this is what you've got. Then trying not to be too crushed if that's not what they want. It's it's not easy, but ultimately, yeah, that's what I do. I appreciate that. You know, it's it's interesting. There was a period of time where I was like, "Who am I to start a podcast?" Like, I don't, I don't know what I'm doing. You know, why, why would I have an interesting, unique take on wanting to talk about like boring stuff like software development on legacy code bases? One, then I feel like there was enough people talking about it, and it's something that I care a lot about because I'm I kind of struggle a little bit with the. Uh, the shiny new objects over there are always are alluring and be like, let's go over there. And like, what if we just rewrite everything and this new thing and all our life would be better. I'm like, we see these waves over the, you've been around for a while. You start to see all these different patterns. You're like, oh, we've, I've seen this happen. I'm just going to stick still over here and let everybody else go chase that down. Um, and so it's, it's, it's an interesting place to sit in and, and I know that I, f- I feel like most people probably end up working on projects that already existed before they started because that's why the company can afford to hire you. Very rarely do you get to work on maybe a brand new project the first day and spin up that new Python or Ruby project or what have you. And someone someone else probably made that decision before you got there for most people, I think. So I just want to let people know, one, it's totally normal to be working on older existing applications. And that's like what most of us end up doing. Let's talk about it because I don't know that our education process always necessarily reflects that because it's maybe hard to jump in and explain, here's what's going on on something. Do you feel like that's an interesting gap in our, do you, do you feel like there's ways that we can make that more understood by people that are coming into this career? Yeah, I don't know. I guess, what should I say? I mean, I I think I am a gently skeptical of a lot of academic side of that, but I think that it's kind of, it's something that I think we all need to be more aware of and be more open about. So, yeah, I mean, I, 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 think, I think there are some, some things like that where we could, I don't know, create an environment where those things are much more accepted. I've always wondered if one of the draws that people have to software development as a career is that it's in some ways, I think it maybe it's evolving, but the myth of what this, of being a software engineer is like, it's kind of like you're a magician and you can like write some stuff on your screen and it, it makes magic happen. <laughs> and, and so you're, you're a magician. And I'm like, well, I always felt like, well, I'm probably more of like a plumber <laughs> than I am of like a magician. I'm like, I'm just connecting pipes and figuring things, making things work. And, keep the house running smoothly. And, and, you know, there's always a lot of like refining and you're going to have to repaint. You're going to have to redo the, there's a lot of regular maintenance work that needs to happen. It's a good profession and it's not a bad thing. I think people don't necessarily want to think of it that way, but I don't feel like it's always presented that way to maybe the, the wider culture. I mean, I think there's a lot of mythology. I mean, when you were talking, it just made me think of um, uh, a project night uh, a few years ago where the the task that the various teams were set was to create a display that had all of the madly scrolling code like you see software developers doing in the movies and it was it was enormously entertaining to do that because of course it was like nothing like the reality that any of us experience so let's imagine that there are some listeners out there and I've, we've gotten a lot of advice from you on things related to community participating in the community asking, answering that question around maybe writing a book, kind of maybe on that one real quickly, what other types of writing have you done before you got to the book? Or did you kind of, I'm starting with a book or had you been blogging for a long time or other types of ways of communicating about this, these types of topics? Um, I, 
was actually recruited by by my agent to uh, do so, to do a book, and that that's actually one that did not ultimately see the light of day. But I was recruited by that because I had done a fair amount of speaking at PyCons and things like that. So it was talks and and that sort of presence that was. I think more important. There were also some some blog posts as well, but that was um, well well before blogging was much of a thing. It was more kind of like I don't know articles, pieces, whatever. I mean, you know, yes, that were that were out on the web. So that was really what what kind of got me started more. Yeah. Nice. Do you feel like that same sort of approach might make sense today? Or should people maybe thinking about other approaches to be acknowledged or noticed like that? I think that these days, some sort of of loosely blogging. I mean, you know, whether it's on one of the one of the various platforms or or however it's done, is probably still a good way to do that. Uh, I think one issue is that. A lot of people maybe aren't that experienced or maybe aren't that comfortable writing. So however that gets developed is all to the good. I had done a dissertation and been in academia, whatever. The the actual mechanics of writing was not something that I was uncomfortable with. I was used to that. But maybe for some people I've seen that that's, you know, something where uh, maybe working up by easier pieces is a little bit beneficial. Nice. Couple of quick last questions for you, Naomi. One, is there a non software, non technical book that you find yourself recommending to peers on a regular basis? That's interesting. That that changes, I think, from from time to time. I think that the last two books I've recommended are Debt, The First Five Thousand Years, which is a fascinating book. And on the other hand, uh, Isabel Allende's Paula, which is a reflection on the death of her daughter, which is probably the most moving book I have read. I'll include links to both those in the show notes for everybody as well. And I feel like there was another guest that mentioned debt, actually. So I should have to go back and look that up. But yeah, I'd heard of it before. So yeah, thanks for that. And how can those listening best follow your thoughts and ruminations or keep up with what you're working on or potentially reach out to you and talk with you at some point about Python or community building? I am still on uh, LinkedIn and you can, can search for me, find me. There's only one other Naomi Cedar and she's in Holland. That's not me. Also on Mastodon, uh, Naomi Cedar at mastodon.art. I deliberately chose the art instance because it was not technical. So there. Yeah. Not everything we we talk about on the internet needs to be tech focused either, right? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Naomi, for stopping by to talk shop with us on Maintainable. So glad to have you join us. It was my pleasure. I enjoyed it. Maintainable.